There we go. Woo! <laughs> now look, y'all could hear me without it, couldn't you? Yeah, yeah. I'm a loud mouth, I know. The problem is, is that this is a little preamble to the sermon. The eight thousand people who listen to these messages on the internet and the 5,000 who watch on YouTube every week couldn't hear if this were not. So that kind of gives you an idea. Yes, indeed. Every week on average, about 8,000 people listen to my U uh, iTunes channel and about 5,000 people watch the sermon in video on YouTube and another 2,000 on my iTunes channel. That's what those cameras in the back are doing. They're videotaping the service, and then I take the sermon and make it into a standalone video presentation. So this church's ministry and message reaches far beyond these walls to people all over the United States who listen and watch on a weekly basis, and indeed people all over the world for there are people in Hong Kong, and Tokyo, and South Africa, and England, and Germany, and France, and Russia, and South America, especially Brazil, and Argentina, and in Mexico, and Nicaragua, who I know because they communicate with me, watch or listen on a regular basis. In other words, Northgate United Methodist Church's voice, mission, and message reaches far away. And if you want to watch, you can go to my website at revneal.org. That's www.revneal.org. Or just go to iTunes and type in Revneal, R-E-V-N-E-A-L, in the search, and it'll take you to my channel. And you can watch from there as well. Let's have a word of prayer. The feeding of the 5,000, it's also known as the miracle of the loaves and fishes. This is a powerful story. It's a powerful story of a miracle of Jesus. It is found in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It is found once in each one of them and twice in Matthew and in Mark. Now, the second time in Matthew and Mark, it's a slightly different version of the story. There are 4,000 being fed with seven loaves. Instead of five loaves and just two fish, it's seven loaves feeding 4,000. But it's essentially the same basic story. That means that the early church, the New Testament church, the church of the apostles, considered this story, this miracle, a very important one. It considered this miracle a very powerful one because it told them a great deal about who Jesus was for them, what Jesus did for them, what Jesus does for the church, and what Jesus does for us. It's a very powerful story which gives us a deep insight into the nature of God's grace, God's unmerited, unearned love and favor. It's a very powerful story because it speaks about, first, what we bring and then what Jesus does with what we bring. You see, we bring our brokenness, our incompleteness, our meager supply, our tiny measure, our insufficient supply. We bring this tiny, meager supply, and Jesus takes it and blesses it, and with his presence, he breaks it and shares it. And in so doing, he shares himself with us and enables us to share ourselves with the whole world. And during the Enlightenment, during the period of the Industrial Revolution and the Enlightenment, when intellectualism began to grow in the Western world, about 300 years ago, especially during the period of Thomas Jefferson, there was an attempt, they began trying, to uncover the real Jesus from the biblical Jesus by thinking, if we removed all of the miracles and all of the supernatural stuff from Jesus, then you'll have the real historical Jesus. And scholars are still doing this today. They think, if we go through and we filter out all of the stuff that looks like it's been added by people who want to believe miraculous things about Jesus and remove all the miracles and all the supernatural stuff, then we'll get down to the real historical Jesus. 
people who do this kind of thing tend to think that miracles can't happen, and therefore they didn't happen. And anyone who says they did must be adding to the story because miracles can't happen. Therefore, they didn't happen. And anyone says they did, you just don't pay much attention to them because miracles can't happen. And so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. It's a nice circular argument, isn't it? Simple fact is, this miracle story, if you take out the miracle, all you have left is sharing your little meager supply. You don't have its multiplication. You have a meager supply that's insufficient. And quite frankly, that's the truth for most of us. In our daily living, in what we do from day to day, what we bring is insufficient. What we bring to the Christian life is not enough. What we bring is insufficient to proclaim the gospel, to be the kind of people that God wants us to. To be. So instead, we bring it, yes, and then Jesus takes it and multiplies it for all. The miracle of the loaves and the fish tells us that we bring a meager supply. We bring our own little insufficiency, our brokenness, our exhaustion. And Jesus, by His grace, in His presence, transforms it multiplies it beyond our expectation. And that's the essence and meaning of the sacrament of Holy Communion. The means of grace are powerful. It's a Wesleyan term, means of grace. It's a term that John Wesley used, pulling from Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox and his own Anglican roots. The concept of means of grace are very simple. Just as I need a, a controller to control the television from back on my couch, just like I need an iPhone to make telephone calls and read emails while I'm on the road, those are instruments through which I receive information or send information or control something from a distance. So also God utilizes instruments, the Bible, the church, worship, hymn singing, service, giving, proclaiming the Scriptures, studying the Scriptures, remembering our baptisms, being baptized in the first place, and celebrating Holy Communion. God uses all of these kinds of instruments, these tools, to communicate to us His wonderful love, His amazing grace. God communicates to us His powerful, life-transforming grace through all these many means. And Holy Communion is just one of them. However, it is the preeminent one. Along with the Word proclaimed in the written Word, Scripture, the Word of God, Jesus Christ, proclaimed in the written Word, the Scriptures, so also we have the sacrament, the Word of God, Jesus Christ, proclaimed to us in the elements and through the elements and by the elements of bread and wine and Holy Communion. We have Word. We have sacrament. We have word, read, understood, interpreted, applied, and we have sacrament, the word experienced, the word received internally and digested internally, the word that nourishes us in a spiritual sense. I did my doctoral dissertation on the sacrament of Holy Communion. And in that doctoral dissertation, I talked about the Methodist understanding of Jesus' presence in Holy Communion. And then I was an advisor to the United Methodist Study Commission on the Sacrament of Holy Communion. And in 2004, they published their understanding, the United Methodist understanding of communion in this holy mystery. And what we said as a denomination is very simple. We said that Jesus is really present in and through Holy Communion. When we come to the table of the Lord and when we receive the sacrament of Holy Communion with faith, Jesus is really present here. Jesus is really present in Scripture. Jesus is really present in prayer. Jesus is really present in service. Jesus is really present in worship. Jesus is really, in, is really present in our study of the Scripture. And Jesus is really present in the sacrament of Holy Communion. And then we say it is through the sacrament that we are brought back 
together with each other and with Jesus Christ. Now, we can't understand, we can't comprehend, we can't explicate with our minds how Jesus is really present. We say that's a holy mystery. But we nevertheless say that it's true. Jesus is really present in the sacrament of Holy Communion in a way that goes beyond our comprehension. And that is where the feeding of the 5,000 connects with the sacrament of Holy Communion. If you look how, at how the story of the miracle is told throughout Scripture, you see it does connect many times in many places with communion. In John's Gospel, for instance, it comes at the beginning of chapter 6. And later on in chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of heaven. I am the bread of life. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. He identifies himself as the bread that came down out of heaven in John chapter 6. The story of the feeding of the 5,000 sets the stage for the proclamation that Jesus in communion nourishes us, strengthens us, feeds us, empowers us to be, to become the hands and the feet and the eyes and the ears and the lips, speaking the good news, enacting the good news of Jesus Christ our Lord. I took a group to Israel in 2010. We went to Israel and we toured both Galilee area and the Jerusalem area. And while we were in the Galilee area, we went to the site where the feeding of the 5,000 took place. And near that site is also the place where Jesus asked Peter, if you love me, feed my lambs. And at that site, they have several altars for worship set up. And I'll never forget standing in a pavilion where this altar was set up at about the site where this event took place. And there's this great big mosaic of John, John Paul II on the wall behind me, by the way. It's a funny photograph if you take a look at it. You can see it on my website. And I'm standing there celebrating Holy Communion for my people and with my people. And I realized in the midst of celebrating communion that day that I was standing where Jesus stood, nearabouts, when he took the bread, the meager supply of the disciples, blessed it, broke it, and gave it multiplied to all the people who were there. And my knees began to shake at the realization that no matter where I am, when I celebrate communion at the table of the Lord, I am where Christ is. I am where Jesus is. Jesus is in our midst. He is within you, within me. He is in the hymns we have sung, the scriptures we have read, and the sacrament we are celebrating today. I don't know what meager supply you are bringing today. And I don't know what your needs are. But whatever you are bringing, Christ Jesus will take it. And by His grace and in His love, He will bless it. And He will multiply it for you. Oh, I can't come to the table of the Lord. I can't come to, to receive Holy Communion. Greg, you don't know what kind of sins I've committed. Oh, Greg, I can't come to church. I don't have any clothes to wear. Oh, Greg, I can't come to church. Those walls would fall down if I walked through those doors. Are you crazy, Greg? No, I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. All are welcome. All are called. All are invited to come to the table of the Lord and receive the strength, the grace, the nourishment that we all need to live a life, the life of the disciple. Oh, Greg, I'm not worthy to come to the table of the Lord and receive Holy Communion. Well, guess what? You're not. Neither am I. Neither is anyone here. Neither is anyone who has ever or who will ever live except Jesus Christ. Only Jesus is worthy. 
And then Jesus makes us worthy when we come to the table of the Lord and when we receive Holy Communion. I'm not worthy to have my meager supply blessed and broken by Jesus. It's far too meager. It's far too paltry. I'm too much of a sinner. Nonsense. The few loaves that Jesus blessed and the few fish that Jesus blessed wasn't enough to feed 5,000 plus people. But God's amazing grace made it possible not only to feed 5,000 plus, but for there to be more leftovers than there were elements to begin with. We may come with a meager supply, but God's grace generates amazing leftovers. Oh, Greg, I can't come to the table of the Lord. I'm too much of a sinner. I can't come to the table of the Lord. Are you crazy? No, I'm not. Rosalind Russell in Auntie Mame said one of my favorite quotes. She said, Life is like a banquet, but most poor slobs are starving to death. Well, guess what? The spiritual life is a banquet. The banquet of Jesus Christ. The banquet of His love. The banquet of His grace. The banquet of His mercy. The banquet of His presence. But unfortunately, most of us poor slobs were afraid of eating of the table of the Lord. We're afraid of reading Scripture. We're afraid of attending worship. Because we fear that God won't accept us. We fear there's something between us and God. Oh, my brothers and sisters, Jesus breached the barrier that we created. Jesus bridged the gap that we dug. Jesus comes to reconnect us, to remember us. Think about that word, remember. It means to take membership and make it again. It's not just a mental action. It's, it's an emotional, spiritual action. Jesus came to remember us together again with God. Why are we starving to death spiritually when there's a banquet feast for us to eat? Why are we starving to death spiritually when the Holy Scriptures are there to be opened and read, studied, and interpreted? Why are we starving to death when worship services are open and available for all? Why is this world starving to death when Christ Jesus has made the banquet available for all? Why are you and why am I? Why are we starving to death? It's a lack of faith. It's fear. Don't let that stand between you today and Christ Jesus at the table of the Lord. Don't let fear and faithlessness stand between you and the grace that Jesus offers you from the table of the Lord. I only have a meager supply to bring. That's all the disciples had. And it was a pretty ratty meager supply too for 5,000 people. But Jesus took it, blessed it, broke it, and fed the multitude. May we also be fed by the grace of Jesus today. And then may we go out and share that wonderful grace of God with the multitude of this world. Today, come to the table of the Lord. All are welcome and invited. All are encouraged to come and feast on the riches of the grace of Jesus Christ offered here. Allow God to take and bless, break and share our meager supply, multiplying it by His love for all.
been listening to a sermon by Dr. Gregory Neal, Senior Pastor of Northgate United Methodist Church and Rector of Grace Incarnate Ministries. Copyright 2011 by Dr. Gregory S. Neal. All rights reserved. For more information or to listen to other sermons by Dr. Neal, visit us on the web at www.revneal.org.